thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. And thank you very kindly, Steve, for inviting us to join you today. Um, as Steve has mentioned, this evening we'll be delivering a presentation on Her Majesty's Coast Guard and her communication methods uh, with obviously the relation to diving as well. Um, as Steve has mentioned, there is a chance to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, we'll start. So I think Steve's already done the honours for us. Um, so here's lovely pictures of us. <laughs> um, I may have taken this photograph this afternoon, so apologies for that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've had a varied history uh, before I came to Her Majesty's <coughs> Coast Guard. Um, having recently come out of the operations room, I'm still quite fresh when it comes to search and rescue, uh, which I think really does help with delivering terrestrial, terrestrial communications and helping to keep the systems working correctly for our Coast Guards all around the coast. And uh, Cheryl is technically my my boss. So, um, but no, uh, she is staff officer of technical services. So as Steve has quite rightly said, she is looking into the future, um, into the, the forward technology that may or may not be there yet and to see what we can deliver to help everyone that's obviously goes on the water or on the coastline of the UK, just to enjoy the water, enjoy the nice area that we have. So to start this presentation, um, I thought it was only right to give a brief history of Hamashi's Coast Guard and how she operates today. Um, obviously, the, the Coast Guard has been going for a while, um, but we'll touch on that. And I'm hoping this will work, but we'll, uh, I'll quickly show this video. Um, it gives a very brief insight into search and rescue aspect of the Coast Guard. And we'll see if this works correctly. I always love it when a video works. I hope it does. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I hope you guys get on here. So you would have seen um, briefly in that video, uh, our Coast Guard rescue officers, uh, you can probably see a little snippet of them there with the high vis jackets and the, the blue hats, and also uh, the HM Coast Guard helicopters as well. Uh, obviously, we also work with the RNLI lifeboats and also our independent lifeboats as well all around the UK coast. Oh, that hasn't worked quickly. <laughs> So Her Majesty's Coast Guard is a Category 1 emergency service under the Blue Light Service uh, as part of the Civil Contingency Plan 2004. And we have a responsibility statement um, of which we follow, which is Her Majesty's Coast Guard is responsible for the initiation and coordination of civil maritime search and rescue within UK search and rescue region. This includes the mobilization, organization, and tasking of adequate resources to respond to persons either in distress at sea or to persons at risk of injury or death on the cliffs or shoreline of the UK. So even uh, anybody who is on the cliff, um, if you go along, say, the southwest coastal path, um, obviously out to sea anywhere. So we will uh, respond to emergencies or persons needing assistance in those locations.
So part of the Coast Guard, we have uh, the six functions of which we follow. And Cheryl, um, I believe in your bio, uh, touched on this. And um, it's part of the International Maritime Organization of which we follow. So the six functions that Her Majesty, Her Majesty's Correction <laughs> Coast Guard follow uh, is vessel traffic management, accident and disaster response, maritime safety, maritime security, pollution response, and search and rescue. Uh, there are other UK department functions of which would uh, help run with the customs, border control, fisheries control, and also law enforcement. I'm just having a little bit of problem with my video to sex. Here we go. Hopefully that's still working. So the International Maritime Organization uh, is the global standard setting authority for the safety, security and environmental performance of uh, international shipping. So it's the main role is to create a regulatory framework for the shipping industry that is fair and effective. Uh, so also that it can be universally adopted and, of course, universally implemented. So I'll also go a little bit uh, into the history of the Coast Guard as well. Some of you may already know um, a little bit about the history, but for those of you that don't, um, prior to 2014, there were 19 maritime rescue coordination centres. Uh, each of these centres would work within a fixed location, which is similar to how your police and ambulance um, services work now with, within a set region. Uh, due to this setup, there was minimal flexibility or support for coordination centres. So you can imagine if there was a, a large uh, incident, a, a stricken tanker off the coast of Plymouth, for example, um, it would be difficult for another maritime uh, coordination centre to assist Falmouth in that case. Um, Due to this, um, there was a look to the future and it was identified that there was a requirement to upgrade the system. So if we now jump to 2021, and I think Charles will agree, there's been a few changes even since we've been with the, the Coast Guard, <laughs> a few name changes here and there. Um, but now, uh, as we stand for 2021, we currently have one Joint Rescue Coordination Centre or I'll reference as the JRCC. We have nine maritime rescue coordination centres, known as MRCCs, and also one maritime rescue sub-centre, which is based at London. Cheryl and I are based, uh, both based at the JRCC, uh, which is in Fareham. Um, any of you on the south coast, and that's between Southampton and Portsmouth. And behind uh, the JRCC, it incorporates both maritime and aeronautical response. So the aeronautical, uh, or another acronym for you guys, sorry, so many that gets bounced around. Um, but another acronym we call it is the ARCC or the ARC, which is basically the helicopters. And they, whilst they work in the same building as MRCC Solent, or colloquially name as Solent Coast Guard, they are very independent in the way that they coordinate. So all the Coast Guard helicopters that you'll see flying around the coast are actually national assets and they can be requested by um, any of the emergency services. So whilst they have our name on it, um, they could be helping a medical transfer one day and then they could be helping with a flood uh, response rescue the next. So with this setup that we have now, it means that we are a very unique emergency service in the way that we operate as a national network. So that, that basically means is um, Cheryl could be working at MRCC Falmouth, for example. I could be working in MRCC Shetland and we can both help with each other's work. Um, it just gives us that flexibility. It means that we're more resilient and it also gives us a really good insight into the what happens around the coast. And everywhere is so different that you've got the South Coast and predominantly the Solent for what our experience is very um, heavy with leisure activities and leisure users. 
And then you'll have uh, possibly Dover that has the, the traffic separation scheme. So they have a lot of uh, your cargo vessels. And then you just go up further up the coast and it just changes um, the dynamic wherever you are. So it's brilliant. And it means that we can help our colleagues if they need help and they need assistance. And it just makes us more robust. And I'll quickly touch on um, the search and rescue region for the Coast Guard as well. And this, this little diagram incorporates the maritime, aeronautical and also land search and rescue, which um, we can assist with. But it may come as a surprise to some. Um, however, the UK search and rescue region uh, may be bigger than you think. Um, so it's covering approximately 2 million square miles and it stretches out uh, to half of the North Atlantic Sea uh, to the west and obviously just that part north of the uh, Shetland Islands. So you can see, um, it's, I don't know if you can ho hopefully see, we've got a blue dotted line obviously going around, that's a maritime search and rescue region. And then there's a solid yellow line, which in just gropes up by the north and then just on the south coast as well. And that's for our aeronautical response. And of course, we have the um, Irish Search and Rescue Region, which um, we work closely with, obviously, the um, Irish Coast Guard if, if we need to. Obviously, if we've got anything uh, that we can help with, um, we work with them as neighbours. So that's great. Uh, yeah, please ignore some of the old wording. As I said, uh, we have gone through a few name changes recently. So um, unfortunately, this uh, picture hasn't been updated yet. So having started in 1822, Her Majesty's Coast Guard is currently 199 years old. And in January next year uh, will be the 200th anniversary. Um, over those years, the Coast Guard has seen a vast amount of change and subsequently grown and adapted to meet current needs. And of course, we all have known the technological advances that we've had um, in our personal and work lives as well. So I'll show you this picture, um, which I found, which should, supposedly was a operations room back in 2012. And I think we can all say in the last 25 years, I think it was, I want to say 1996, I believe, the born of the internet. I could be wrong on that. Um, but we have seen how, how the technology has changed the way that we as I say, live our lives and how we work. And this is also the case for how the Coast Guard operates. And obviously myself and Cheryl, um, we work as part of the technology team. So we can see those advances happening day in, day out and kind of looking to the next steps. What can we do? What can we do to make our response quicker? What can we do to help deliver the best search and rescue that we can? And always looking for that improvement and technology means that we can do that and to ease the operator as well mm. um to you know bring the burden off them when it's so busy um and uh you know to alleviate possible work patterns or processes that actually don't need to be in place that technology yeah. can alleviate. yeah there's i think there's positives and negatives to technology sometimes mm. the positives it can quicken processes up but then in negatives you can have almost so many systems going at one time it just almost overloads yeah, yeah. It makes it kind of clogs up so um definitely not what we're trying to do <laughs> <laughs> and here's a, just a picture um of our operations room down at the jrcc as you can see the technology is very different um many screens on the desk and we do obviously have robust computer systems able to handle large volume instance in one go. So when you're speaking to an operator, um, he or she will be using um, up to five screens at one time. And each of these screens will allow um, them to do different processes, such as using um, touchscreen interface to speak to via VHF on the radio, or answer a 909 call, um, look at different mapping, 
um, look at the weather. It's so many different things. If you saw an operator screen, sometimes you think, how are you keeping track of all of that? <laughs> <laughs> So I will obviously start going on to the whole reason why um, we're here today, but I thought I'll give you a little bit of um, history before we started. So the next part of this presentation, I'll be going through the main communication methods for contacting the Coast Guard. And I will be um, talking about the communication methods that are within the sea area A1 of the GMDSS, the Global Maritime Distress Safety System, um, of which stretches between zero to 50 nautical miles out to sea, obviously depending on aerial height, conditions, uh, et cetera. So the methods that I'll be talking about today are not the only communication methods for contacting the Coast Guard. Um, we do have other um, systems to use, but these are the ones that I think is more predominantly that you guys will be using when you're out and about. So, I'll start with the very obvious, um, the VHF, the very high frequency radio. And we are probably all very familiar uh, with the use of VHF radio. It is an, such an important safety tool for all mariners who venture out in the water. So Her Majesty's Coast Guard is responsible for the integrity of the international, international distress urgency and safety calling frequency which is channel 16 uh, or 156.8 megahertz, if um, you're interested in the frequency. Um, so you'll hear um, the phrases DRS being knocking around, and that's our distress urgency safety. And the Coast Guard will have a continuous listening watch on channel 16 at all times. So you could be, I know, I don't know if you'll be out at about 3 a.m. in the morning, but you might be um, if you're ever on the water. Um, and we are always listening. And that's wherever you are on the coast. Uh, it's it's good to know that someone's there. And we have had stuff come through at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're wide awake. <laughs> um, we also uh, have routine channels, working channels, 6, 7 and 7, 3. And uh, VHF marine radios are used for a variety of purposes, including, you know, contacting harbors and marinas, uh, submarine rescue services uh, such as Coast Guard, or your normal ship to shore and ship to ship communications. Um, the obviously with the VHF, uh, there is a um, certificate uh, that still remains in place that you will need, and you will be required to use. Um, you'll be required to have to be able to use the uh, VHF radio. So it is important, obviously, to look into that um, if you are looking to have a VHF on board your vessel. Um, but as I've mentioned, we are there, or the Coast Guard is there to, in, in a big nutshell, listen for distress, urgency and safety traffic. If you ever hail us, um, on channel 16 and and it's not prefixed with any type of trans um if it's not prefixed with a mayday or pan for example then you will straight away be moved to a routine or working channel and that is basically so we can keep channel 16 completely clear as much as we can to make sure that anyone that does need to contact us for those distress incidents they are able to and I've put uh, for the range um, approximately 30 to 50 nautical miles offshore. Uh, this is only because when it comes to uh, VHF, it is difficult to answer the range definitively. Um, radio travels as waves, it's similar to light, and it could be reflected, reduced, um, or even stopped by objects. So you could be right in near the shoreline and you'll struggle to get, uh, if you're, sorry, if you're like underneath a cliff, for example, uh, you'll struggle to get uh, VHF reception. So therefore we usually range um, advise around 50, 30 to 50 nautical miles. And this of course can depend on the weather, the power output, the height of the antenna, the position on the cliff, uh, position on the water. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a few things obviously to keep in mind. Uh, when using VHF. And we do have um, many 
uh, remote radio sites that are strategically placed around the shoreline of the UK. Uh, so, and there's there's works for improving um, these services that are uh, happening on a regular basis to try and make those remote radio sites more robust to um, to make sure that we can obviously listen to as much as possible. Um, obviously, there there will be areas of which are trickier to hear um, or receive distress traffic or any traffic. So it is worth obviously looking into your local area wherever you are going. But most of the time, it's it's pretty robust. So another way of which you can communicate uh, with us at the Coast Guard is with DSC, Digital Selective Calling. And DSC is simply a tone signaling system uh, which operates on the Channel 70 VHF and is similar to, say, a, a tone dialing on a phone, um, but with the ability to include data. So this can include your vessel's identification details, um, the reason uh, for the call, and the vessel's position. And you can also include uh, the channel which you want to communicate with. The main thing that we like with DSC is the red button. And the red button is a really good system and it means that you can simply press hold. You're in a distress situation. You might not even have time to lift up the receiver and hit your push to talk and deliver a mayday. By pushing that red button and holding it and sending out a signal, you are telling other vessel users and also shore stations, uh, such as the um, Maritime Rescue Coordination Centres, that you need assistance. So with DSC, um, it, when it comes to positional information and whilst gaining, a, um, gaining an alert obviously on our system is fantastic. If we have your vessel name, your MMSI, which should be coded within the device, brilliant. It means that we can start looking up your vessel, what type is it, what size is it, et cetera. Um, but one thing we really need is positional information. And with the device, um, depending obviously which one you buy, you can either have a um, position that is manually entered by the user, or alternatively, you can have it with an integrated um, GNSS encoded chip. So it'll pick up your GPS location. And this, when it is integrated into the device, it means that as soon as you hit that distress button, your most accurate and most up-to-date position will be included in that distress message. And that is just so important yeah. to be able to get that um, helicopter or a lifeboat um, or even requesting other vessels to come and assist you. If we can give them a lat and long position, it just quickens up our search. And obviously, I mean, God forbid anything happens on board, but and sadly, things do happen and having that information is just the creme to the creme. <laughs> and I would agree with Luxury here is the DSC will give us far more accuracy straight away with a DSC call than a voice mayday call. So um, within DMDSS, especially with um, Merchant Navy Mariners, they are trained to either press the red button, as Luxury was talking about, or pre-program the particular distress that they are encountering. So for example, if you're sinking, et cetera. So if we already know what the, the, the distress um, is before you even make a voice call on 16, it means that we can already start mobilizing assets before you've even picked up the receiver. Um, so for me, DSC is incredibly important and actually I would say more important than VHF voice mm. because it means that we get a far more um, accurate uh, position and vessel information um, compared to voice um, especially if um, because if it's a distressing situation 
you may not say the Latin long properly mm. um, or or your actual distress or how many persons on board. So for me, top tip, definitely, if you don't have a DSE radio already, is to get one mm. and to make sure, like Lux was saying, about getting the um, GPS integrated into it because some um, will put a position into the DSC and we once we get a distress message we can tell how old that position is mm. and if the position matches the time that the DSC was sent we know that that G GPS information is correct but sometimes it can be say four five hours old which means that our search is far more difficult so if you don't have a GPS um, integrated into your DSC that would be one of my recommendations to mm. do that. Yeah definitely and as Charles mentioned in a mayday situation your your mind might, it might just go blank and I had it a few weeks ago and the gentleman I was speaking to just was panicked and he couldn't give me the information I needed and that would just the DSC is amazing in that fact. It just eliminates that human aspect to it. And, yeah, I would say it's brilliant. And, of course, you you don't have to be thinking to press the red button. You could have a medical emergency on board. If there's two persons on board and you have a medical emergency, you might need to tend to that person. Um, so hitting that DSC button means that you can send out the alert and we, will, we take it as a distress. We take it as your needing our assistance straight away i think i've had one perfect may day in the time that i was in the ops room i think we all listened to it and went is that, that real yes, <laughs> <I'm> real. <laughs> that was almost too perfect yeah. <laughs> i do remember that yeah. <laughs> and the next um part of obviously going on to is obviously our 999 telephone um service so we all use or majority of us uh, will have mobile phones uh, with us day in day out and they are obviously a great asset and can come in handy for many tasks throughout the day for some people and you know we're still trying to put the message out there as well through like radio and tv um, but coast guard is an emergency service and you can call 909 and we are one of the options to to request for and by calling 909 and asking for Coast Guard, you will be put through to the nearest Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre based on the position um, uh, of your phone. So mobile phones are a great tool um, as they do not require any additional licences. However, there are fallbacks. Uh, battery life, I know mine's not very good on my phone anymore. Um, you could it could fall out your back pocket plop straight in the water it's gone and of course signal as well it's not guaranteed on the water whilst i think we all agree you can get pretty good signal off off the coast but it's 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 obviously not guaranteed we as a coast guard would always recommend that you carry at least two forms of independent means for raising distress um so if you carried a phone and a vhf or your DSC, etc. So it's always really good to have one main one and a backup if you need it. So I mentioned um, when you call 909 and you ask for the Coast Guard, we will get um, some positional information. And you can see on the PowerPoint here, I've re referenced um, ISEC and AML. So ISEC is the Enhanced Information Service for Emergency Calls, and I believe it was um, originally created by the B uh, BT, British Telecom. And this information displays the mobile service provider, um, and it also gives us some um, basic positions using Easting and Northings, um, and this is deduced from cell tower triangulation. Uh, it gives us a, a general area, but it's, it's not particularly accurate, is it? It's, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very difficult, especially from an operations perspective. It's We can say, okay, you're generally in that area, um, but even being out in the water, it might, it might even be more uh, difficult uh, to pinpoint where you are. Isaac, sorry, to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, Isaac's no. really good and was designed for um, landline telephony. Mm, yeah. So, um, 
if you um, have a landline telephone and whoever is registered to your landline, if you call 999 from your landline telephone, it means that the emergency service um, already has your address of, of your location. So, for example, you know, if you needed an ambulance or the fire brigade, I'm going to call the fire service now, <laughs> okay. um, or police, they automatically know your address if you call from a landline. But with mobile information, it goes off the mast. So, yeah, like Lux was saying, although we know a rough area, we have to do um, a longer uh, calculation to be able to just get a section of, of where mm. that mobile phone is. Yeah. And with um, with newer, obviously, smartphones that are uh, coming out now, uh, there's also AML, which is Advanced Mobile Location. And this basically can deduce your position down a lot more accurate and um, could be down to 10 metres or less. Um, I've, I've read a few articles online where they've deduced it down to like a particular side of a road that a person was standing on. Um, but of course, it isn't, isn't guaranteed, um, but it does mean that the newer the phone, uh, particularly the smartphone, it will give us that data that we need. We will always verbally confirm with you um it's always a question that we ask what's your position where are you obviously you guys will be mostly on the water um so hopefully you'll be able to give us a latin long a latitude longitude um but if you can't then um positions uh like landmarks on the coast or if you're diving on a particular wreck um we do have uh, most of those charts as well so it's really good um to have a smartphone or a, a mobile with you but it's I'd say it should be an company method it shouldn't be your only method and I'll move on to uh, beacons so um, there are three beacons predominantly in use um, you have your ELTs your EPIRBs and your PLBs I'm not obviously going to touch on ELTs because they are aviation based um, but a COSPAS SARSAT beacon, also called a distress radio beacon or emergency beacon, is a radio transmitter that can be activated in a life-threatening emergency to summon assistance from government authorities. The International COSPAS SARSAT program and intergovernmental cooperative of 43 countries and agencies maintains a network of satellites and ground facilities to receive distress signals from four or six megahertz beacons. And then it routes um, the alerts to the proper authorities to around more than 200 countries and territories. So four or six megahertz is the radio frequency band on which the beacons transmit. And this band is monitored around the earth by COSPAS SARSAT. So, I'm quite passionate about beacons, um, as sorry I mentioned. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I know it's um, it's not it's not really comes under our our job roles because um, that's it's for somebody else. But it is definitely a fun, it's a really good way to contact the Coast Guard if you need to. Um, I was a mission control center operator. Um, it's something that I, I qualified in to be able to receive alerts, validate uh, the information that's come through, because sometimes it can be corrupt, and then pass that on to the appropriate coordinating authority. Um, so all COSPAS asset um, beacons, so EPIRBs and your PLBs, will transmit on the 406 megahertz frequency and this is protected within this service. So we shouldn't receive any other um, devices transmitting on that frequency. And the EPIRBs, the emergency position indicating radio beacon, these are predominantly sat on your vessels and your PLBs, your personal locator beacons um, can be used in a variety of different settings. Um, some people use it on an aircraft, like small um, aircrafts. Some people use it go kayaking. Um, some people will obviously be on their boats. They're going sailing um, up mountains, for example. So it's a really, really handy tool. I think there was a job um, recently in the news back in September 
where a gentleman on board a fishing vessel I'm seeing this and he had a life jacket on had a PLB inside the life jacket he tripped fell overboard um ended up obviously in the middle of the water this is off Plymouth I believe and he remembered that he had a PLB on board um on board his life jacket which he then activated and that is how we found out he was in the water we had no other comms it was simply just that distress uh, come through so as soon as we get that distress alert come through and we validate the data uh, which I'm talking about minutes by the way it's not <laughs> it's not a lengthy process it'll be minutes then that in that case that beacon alert would have been passed on to MRCC Falmouth and they would have uh, coordinated the rescue so they will basically send an asset to that location to investigate further so it's not always clear obviously with an EPUB we're pretty sure it's going to be either a vessel or a life raft, especially if they've taken it with them. Um, but with a PLB, it can be a mixture. I believe actually as well that you can get um, watertight canisters for diving. I think I looked, I definitely had a look online the other day. So that might be something that some of you are interested, in, especially if you surface and the dive boat is nowhere nearby, then it could be something that you look into. Um, we all beacons do also func um, do function outside of the UK search and rescue region. So if you were off the French coast, for example, and you activated your PLB or EPIRB, then that will still be picked up by the UK Mission Control Centre and then passed on to our long range search and rescue function, which sits within the Coast Guard. So. Sorry, I have digressed a bit, but I just, <laughs> I think beacons are great and definitely something that if you are interested in, have a look into it as they can, they can be really handy. Yeah, I would agree with Lux. This is another really <laughs> important tool that you can use um, to, to essentially save your life. Um, and again, if you're uh, into other types of sports like mountain, hike, mm. mountain hiking and kayaking or sailing a PLB could potentially save your life mm. um and I'm not quite up to date on the prices but they are coming down rapidly yeah and or, like new new ones are coming out on the market all the time I want to say about 150 pounds but I think they might be slightly more than that it, it depends on what you get obviously the the better or the higher the more you pay tends to be sometimes the, the better quality that you get obviously we're not um Experts. <laughs> in, in that sense obviously the processing side of it definitely um but yeah there, there's definitely them out in the market and when you obviously purchase a beacon you will need to um register it uh in which you can do via government website um and that means basically if your plb or epub does go off um then we will basically check that system and we'll be able to see um uh, the vessel details, if it's a PLB and you're using it predominantly for diving and kayaking and mountaineering, for example, you could put all of those in uh, like a details area for that for that particular beacon. So it gives us an indication who we're looking for um, what, and what activity you could be doing. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth looking into. <laughs> and one of the Thing as well with EPIRBs is I think a lot of people think that you have to be sinking to set off or to activate the EPIRB. Um, obviously that's predominantly why they're there but if you had say a med medical emergency on board and that was your only way of getting help then you can manually activate it and we will treat it the same. It will be initially be distress and we'll to come to your assistance as quickly as we can question for you just before we move on yeah <laughs> um the new types of epubs mm. are they getting a receiving signal to say that the signal's been received i believe that is the next generation next generation i believe that is yes so um just for context at the moment if you set off an epub 
you won't get an indication that the signal has been received. Mm. But the next generation EPIRBs, you'll set them off and then the light will turn green. Not sure on that. Okay. I would not, definitely look into that. Sure. It's, um, I've kind of come out of it now, so I'm not necessarily on the forefront of that, but there's lots of information yeah. out on the internet. So, yeah. But you definitely. get an indication to say that your distress has been received. Yeah. And that means more to people because they know, oh, it's been received. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely progressing. <laughs> So it's going on to the next part. It's easy for me to talk about um, these different communication methods, um, but it's also just as important of what to say. And I've included some helpful, hopefully helpful information uh, if you do need to call, say, a, a Mayday or a Pan Pan on VHF, for example. So if you were to find yourself in a distress situation, call the Coast Guard immediately. Time is seriously of the essence. We cannot say that enough. And it's imperative that you call us as soon as you recognise that you need help. We take all calls for help seriously. And if you haven't given us the information that we need, we will ask of it for you. We will ask the information um, and more sometimes. I think sometimes people think, well, why do you need to know that for? But there's there's always a reason behind our question. So how to help to help us to help you, um, you can give us some information um, at the time of your broadcast. So I'll predominantly talk about um, VHF distress, um, but this can also work for a pan as well, which is an urgency. So with VHF distress, we would uh, always recommend if you do have a DSC um, part on, on your radio device is to activate the DSC first and then conduct your uh, VHF distress broadcast on channel 16. So what will happen from an operations perspective is on our system, we'll get an alarm that comes up, we'll get your DSC distress alert come through, we can open that up. And as we've mentioned, depending if you've got uh, GPS coded or if it's manually entered, we'll have your position. We should hopefully have your MMSI, your vessel um, name, and hopefully a, a nature of distress if that has been selected. And then what we should then hear, hopefully, is uh, a VHF transmission over channel 16. It just gives us that little bit it alerts, of a warning. Yeah, it? it alerts the 16 operator as well because they can mm. you know that something's coming through if you can hear that DSC alarm going off it's a distinctive tone mm -hmm. um so yeah so we'll start off with mayday um so remember to prefix your dress distress traffic this will tell other radio users you need help and it also helps to keep the channel clear from unnecessary traffic when you uh call a mayday your um you're basically asking for other vessels to keep quiet unless they have a mayday or, or a pan situation of themselves. Um, you're imposing silence, as they say. Once uh, you've obviously prefixed it, you will need to identify yourself. So your vessel name, uh, your call sign, MMSI, um, or other type. I've said other type because not everyone has a call sign um, or an MMSI. Um, when they hail us. So that's just from personal experience. Position um, goes without saying, we need to know where you are, where we can send you help. Preferably, we would like a latitude and longitude if you can. Um, but if not, then we will discuss that with you at the time, obviously verbally. Um, if, as I say, if you're diving over a particular wreck or if you are in line with the particular landmark that's on the shoreline, if you can tell us how far you are away from that landmark, then we can use that um, as well. Nature of distress, um, we will need to know, are you having an emer medical emergency? Is there a fire on board? Have you got a man overboard or um, a diver medical um, or a diver missing, for example? Assistance required, um, what help do you require? It sounds like a, a, a silly statement in a way, but 
Um, if you are doing more of like a urgency broadcast, you may not need immediate assistance. You may be just notifying the Coast Guard that this is happening. You have it in hand, but it gives us that step ahead. It gives us, right, okay, this is going on with this vessel. We're aware of it. And it means that we can um, put in steps to help if we need to. Number of persons on board. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. We need to know how many persons that you have on that vessel and any other information that might be pertinent to the Mayday distress. So uh, the weather, if it's if it's suddenly a gale force eight or nine and you're caught in a storm and I don't know, it's going to be a bad day if that happens. But yeah, if it's pertinent to the information um, that you're providing us, then then that will be great. It can be hard to remember everything like that in a distress situation, as we've, as we've mentioned. Um, and talking from experience, if you can give us your position and how many persons on board and a beach switch and what's going on, that is like gold. Um, we can have all the information in the world, but if we don't have your position, we can obviously take, we can obviously look at the aerial which you've come through. Um, it just makes it's it a lot, lot easier. Uh, yeah, not having your positional information makes it a lot harder for us to help you. So yeah, as I've mentioned, if it's not as serious as a May Day, then you can use Pan Pan. Um, similar concept, just tells the listener that you need assistance, but you're not in grave and imminent danger. Is one to add on that too? No, <laughs> and similar to when you call 999 and I don't know about you but I think I've called it once in my life um well not when I've um, been checking the systems but um when you call 999 and ask for the coast guard a trained operator will answer with the words coast guard rescue and once the operator says those two words that's our invitation for you to start telling us what's happening. So, as I say, Coast Guard Rescue, and then we're just expecting words to come through our headset. <laughs> and we'll be furiously typing away and we'll start to ask our next questions. And our main ones are, who, who's involved? Um, where are you? What's the weather like? Um, Obviously, depending where you are. What's, um, the, what's the distress as well? Yeah, what's, what's the incident? distress? Yeah, what's... Obviously, we expect that to come through initially. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to call us up on 99 for, for nothing. So, um, yeah. And just one thing I also also want to reiterate is when you call 99 and you're speaking to an operator, they will be, fierce, as I say, furiously typing away and in real distress situations, a job will be created very quickly. And that operator may stay on the phone with you, but that doesn't mean that there's not other people working in the background, tasking lifeboats, tasking helicopters if it requires it, um, getting you the help. And they may, and the Channel 16 operator may start creating Mayday relay broadcasts to tell other vessels you are stricken in this position, can anyone go and assist? So you might be on the end of that phone thinking, oh my God, keep asking me questions, I just need help. The help is being arranged in the background. And it, I can imagine being on the end of that phone is probably quite stressful, but I just can't wanted to say that. Um, So I'll move on to um, two of the main kind of incidents of which are more diver orientated. And obviously this is not definitive, um, definitive of what can happen, obviously to divers, but it's the two main ones of which we do focus on. And especially when it comes to um, the more, obviously the spring summer time and when people are more likely to go out diving, it's, really important that we keep on top of um, what can happen to divers and I mean I've personally had good stories and bad stories and yeah it's just something that we always like to keep on top of. 
So I'll start with a topic um, which I'm sure that you're all very familiar with. You're probably even better explaining it than I am um, just from, from your experience. But yeah, decompression sickness or the Benz, I believe it's locally named. Um, on the slide that you can see is some of the basics of the information that you'll be asked for by a Coast Guard operator. If you are within telephone signal, um, we would recommend calling us on 999. This will allow for more of a private connection and it means that also you're gonna be giving over quite personal information and doing that on the phone is a lot easier than doing it on the radio. We can do it on the radio and we will move you to a, a duplex channel, um, which uh, is two ways. So it means it's more private. Um, but if you do have a telephone on board, it just it alleviates that kind of um, that, uh, that middle kind of yeah. problem. So depending on the situation and the diver condition, um, we may put the dive vessel, uh, the skipper of the dive vessel, or whoever we're speaking to, um, in a connect call with the with a dive doctor um, to speak with either the skipper or someone on board directly. And we, the Coast Guard, will always seek medical advice from trained and certified professionals. So dive doctors, for example, they are obviously the professionals in their field. And this is why we'll ask you for dive details. So the depth, was there any stops I've missed? Um, was there a dive computer, your gas mix? And also if you've dived in the last previous 24 hours, depth, duration, etc. It's important that we get that information because we will then need to speak to a dive doctor to have their um, professional aspects on it. And we will be listening to the dive doctor for their medical advice. And that will also help us with um, extracting a person if required from, from, the, uh, from the dive vessel. So if we did put you in a connect call either by telephone or by radio, then we, the Coast Guard, will always be listening. and. We're still coordinating that call. We're just in the background. We'll just be listening to the conversation and um, making sure that you guys have got two-way communication so you can speak to each other. That goes without saying that's not always to be expected. Um, we may not need to put you in a connect call. We may have enough information to do the call ourselves. Um, but it's something that you could expect if you did contact us with a diver with decompression sickness. So it's just handy to know. If um, if there is a dive buddy um, that um, has obviously gone down with a person or come up with a person that had decompression sickness, um, they would usually be expected to accompany the patient to um, say a hyperbaric chamber and to also bring the dive computer with them as well. So it's just handy to, to know that bit of information as well. And Please also <laughs> inform the Coast Guard if you have any remaining divers down as well and for how long that you expect the duration of their dive to continue for. This just means that we, well, when you contact us, we are automatically immediately starting to think ahead. Okay, what can we task? What's the next steps? And if we know that you have divers down, it means that we think, okay, right, if we're going to task a lifeboat, we need to make sure that we inform them about the divers. How long is it going to take the lifeboat to get there? Will the divers that are currently down have serviced already? So all that kind of information is really important to us and it just helps us plan a um, extraction or evacuation from the boat if needed um, the best and quickest way possible. And it, it goes without saying, but depending on the situation, the diver will either be taken to, um, say, a hyperbaric chamber or A&E. And evacuation will uh, depend on the severity or 
the information that we get from the dive doctor. Um, and this would be either by lifeboat or by helicopter. And I don't want to, I can't, it's, it's hard to kind of talk about this because it's all very, we have a process in place, but all instances are different, aren't they? So, um, yeah, it's, this is not a definitive list of questions. This is not the concrete, this will happen in these particular steps, but it is just an overall um, we liaise with dive doctors um, in love by going to hyperbaric chamber or um, to A and E. So, yeah, it's just just having that in, enlightenment. If yeah, if you've got it to hand, it just makes the call a little bit quicker as well. Mm, and also, it means that you you guys know that when you call us, um, whichever method that you use, you know that we have these processes in place and. Like you will understand, oh, okay, no, I do understand that they will be um, in contact with, say, a dive doctor, et cetera. So within the operations room, um, the senior mission coordinator, known as an SMT, will pull all this uh, information together um, and a decision will be made, obviously, with regards to evacuation. And everything, say... Um, so when they say if a, lot, a helicopter sorry, is tasked and they come to evacuate a diver, then it is, um, what would I say, the, the helicopter, once they get on scene, they're basically in control of that extraction. So, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of cogs in a wheel and there's a lot of stuff going on happening at one time. And it can be quite um, a stressful situation, especially if the diver is very unwell. Um, but please be assured that we work literally as quick as we can to get that help to you as soon as possible. Um, I believe there's around 22 hyperbaric chambers around the coast, I believe. Um, so, yeah, there's there's quite a few around um, around the coast. And, I mean, it goes without saying, but we just implore you to contact us at any point that you're concerned that a diver may be suffering with um decompression sickness and we'll be able to take that information from you and as I say we can liaise with dive doctor straight away and time is key and it's something that we cannot get back um if if wasted so it's really um really good to have and it's it's a horrible thought and neither Cher and I or oh, it's just literally the makes my blood run cold when I think about it but um to think of a diver going missing is just horrible but it's it's it's, it's crucial that we cover the subject because it, it can happen um so here is some information on um the powerpoint of some questions that we will ask you if um or whoever we're speaking to on the vessel about the diver um that is missing Obviously, there's three uh, it's key that we know um, characteristics, obviously what they're wearing, did they have a surface marker, have they got any locator aids, um, do they have any strobes, just anything that can help us with that search is great. Uh, last known position of the diver, what time was this, that can help us with our searches as well. There's also three factors has a diver surfaced um, but unable to um, recover or locate so they could have surfaced but they couldn't find the boat um, is the diver simply overdue but there's no further information or and there is a case obviously if the diver is trapped um, underwater as well so sadly we do not coordinate underwater searches um, or rescue operations Unfortunately, we don't have the specialised knowledge or access to a declared facility capable of effecting an underwater search and rescue operations. Um, decisions as to what underwater actions are required are required to lie with the dive supervisor. Um, if the diver is known to have surfaced, um, then we treat it as as like a person in the water, of which we have. Um, 
is kind of bread and butter mm-hmm. of the Coast Guard and is something that um, we, we do quite a bit. So we have obviously processes in place and searches that we create to be able to pass to lifeboats and uh, helicopters uh, if required. So if you want to add up on that? Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so just... A bit of general information. I know obviously I've been talking quite a lot, so we'll move um, swiftly on. My PowerPoint's going to let me. There we go. So we are your Coast Guard. So I know there was something mentioned in an email that we received from Steve about, you know, how to recontact you, like on VHF. And if you cannot remember the name of the Coast Guard station you're in range of, don't worry. Just simply hail UK Coast Guard and your nearest shore station will respond and confirm their station name. So for example, um, if I was a dive vessel called Star, for example, I could say UK Coast Guard, this is dive vessel Star over. And the shore station, for example, let's say uh, Solent Coast Guard will say dive vessel Star, this is Solent Coast Guard, change the channel 67, standby. So yeah, so it basically means that the um, the Coast Guard has heard your broadcast and requested that you move to a routine uh, channel. So yeah, it's very simple if you need to contact us and you just don't know which shore station to speak to. So I want to briefly touch on the MSI as well. I'm not sure um, how many people how many people know about this. Uh, I think it is obviously quite well known. Uh, but the maritime safety information is a vital information broadcast of which includes lots of information pertinent to mariners. So depending on your position around the coast will depend on which area or which channel that you need to listen to. But if you are keeping a listening watch on channel 16, uh, you will hear a short transmission uh, from the shore station announcing the broadcast. And this will happen between I think it's around 7.10 to 7.30 and then every three hours after that. And there are two different types of broadcasts. Um, the one between 7.10 and 7.30 a.m. to uh, the subsequent 12 hours later will be a long broadcast, and all the rest will be a, a shorter, more condensed broadcast. And this will um, have in very um, varied information, depending, as I say, on the location and the timing, this will include uh, your inshore waters forecast up to 12 miles offshore, uh, your gale warnings, uh, your shipping forecast, and longer one, uh, any local navigational warnings, firing range information if that's applicable to your area, uh, fishing forecasts, etc. And this information can be found on the government website. So if you simply type in maritime safety information forecast into Google, you should be able to find the gov.uk website with the um, PDF with the details on it. And there's one thing that um, uh, was popped in an email from Steve as well was about AIS as well. So the automatic identification system is, I think it's a really important and informative tool for us. Uh, if you um, if you held us on, on VHF, for example, and all we captured was your vessel name and you had AIS. This means that we can check our system and we can search basically like live search. If you've got your AIS turned on, then that should then be able to give us uh, your positional information. And whilst you're not required to have AIS, and I know there's obviously a lot of vessels that um, may not have it, um, it is a tool that, as I say, can really help us to find you quickly and easily. And it uh, it was also mentioned about passage plans as well. So how you log your passage plan is up to you. Um, We at the Coast Guard would recommend the RYA Safe Track system. And I will stop talking for a couple of minutes and let you listen to our um, colleague, uh, Tim, who explains the Safe Tracks system. So hopefully this will work for you. It's gonna work. 
Oh, maybe not. Oh, right, yeah, there we yeah, go. Here we go. <laughs> Just thinking about it. Safe Tracks is a smartphone app that you can download and make use of when you're doing activities at the coast, from walking to stand up paddle boarding, kayaking, sailing, whatever it might be. At HM Coast Guard, we can use the information in the app to get you help should you find yourself in difficulties. Safe Track enables you to store information about any coastal activities you might do. You can put your journey uh, so you can put a start point uh, and an end point and some waypoints along the way if you wish if you're simply going for a walk or a paddle you can turn on the track mode which updates the app with your location at hm coast guard we're not sat there watching and monitoring you in the app the only time we access the information is if you or your emergency contact asks us for help. If you are running late or, or overdue on your passage, then the app will notify you uh, and give you the option to extend that journey. Um, but if you don't extend that journey, it will simply notify your emergency contact if you're running late. And then they can make a decision to contact you or if they're concerned, they can ring 999 ask for the Coast Guard and at that point we can access information uh, about your position, uh, the journey and track you've taken and also details about the vessel or activity you're undertaking so you get the right help to the right place. Before you go on your next adventure make sure you download the Safe Tracks app, pop in the relevant information, charge the phone don't forget all your usual safety equipment or whatever activity you have to take. So as I say, um REO Safe Tracks is a great tool and it's one that we obviously do work closely with. But um Cheryl will agree with me, we've had it in the operations room where um a loved one has called in and said, My husband or wife or Whoever was due back two hours ago, for example, he was going, he or she was going from this place to this place, etc. Gave more the details about what they're in, vessel, kayak, etc. And them calling us is just as good as obviously information that's been safe tracks. Obviously, the safe tracks obviously does give us a bit more passage information. Um, but yeah, telling a loved one and getting them to call us in uh, if, if you are overdue is, in my eyes, just mm -hmm. as good. So it is totally um, up to you. We're just coming to the end of this um, presentation. And one thing that we want to say, um, safety is important. So next time you go on the water, make sure you check your VHF radio and that you're tuned into Channel 16. Check if applicable, uh, your DSC equipment is working correctly. Uh, check that you are wearing the appropriate safety gear, uh, life jackets, depending on your activity. Um, you check that you have two or more independent means uh, to raise the stress uh, if required. And as we've just touched on, if you are going out on your own to a loved one, uh, when and where you're traveling to or from, including what time you're leaving and when to expect you back. So that is the end. Um, thank you very much for listening to me ramble. I feel like I'm sick of my own voice now. <laughs>